Thank you so much. Isn't that nice? It's very nice. Well, here we are again. I know. We're, we're, it's old home week. It really is. It's uh, the remake or the... Um, so I've seen this new wonderful movie you're in. Yes. That I don't think anyone except possibly our own nearest and dearest in this room have yet seen. And uh, Sue was saying um, it's about when you're, when you're allowed to lie or to some extent and tell, or tell a white lie, yeah. even within a good marriage. Um, yes. The premise is not a secret. It's not really a spoiler. It's not, explain what the plot trigger is, because it's so incredible. I, I will. So the, the, um, I play Beth, who is a novelist. And she's uh, in a long marriage with uh, her uh, wonderful husband, who's a therapist, played by the awesome Tobias Menzies, who you know is Prince Philip from The Crown. And, um, and uh, he, uh, she has had one book that was moderately successful. It was a memoir. It did fine. And now she's written a second book uh, that is a work of fiction. She's been working on it for some time. Her husband has been unbelievably supportive. He's read draft after draft and told her how much he loves it. He thinks it's fantastic. She rely, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> she, she very much relies on his um, support and, and input. Uh, only at a certain point in the movie, she overhears him talking to someone else about how much he dislikes the book. <laughs> and her world turns upside down. And that's really the premise of the film, um, to a certain extent. Um, it's uh, the ripple effect of that moment for her. And I remember, actually, Frank, when I was first telling you about this movie yes. back in the day, and I told you that premise, and Frank, who is, of course, a wonderful writer, went, <laughs> it's, it's, it, Well, it really strikes home. I mean, it strikes home as too close to home because we're, we're, our spouses are both in versions of the same business we're in. Yes. My, my wife is also a writer. And, yes. You know, and you think this could happen. I mean, I hope not. But this, I hope you know, not, uh, yeah. Um, and, uh, and one thing, I, there are many things I like about the movie, but one thing, it is sort of set in very present-day Manhattan. Yes. And it's, it's, a, a, it's a, what, a Paragon store, right, where... Yes, um, Paragon, yes, Yes, downtown. which is like the most unlikely place to overhear a conversation that could rock a marriage in broad daylight. <laughs> yeah. You should also say that the, <laughs> the character of uh, Don, the husband, is a, is a psychologist. Yes. And talk a little bit about, there's a parallel story uh, in the film, uh, sort of a counterpoint, about the whole issue of when you might lie to your own patients if you're a shrink or withhold things or they might or how they lie to you and how, or how they lie to you yeah. exactly she, he's also sort of suffering um, uh, a crisis of confidence he's questioning his own ability as a therapist uh, I don't want to give too much away but he overhears a patient say something about him that uh, <laughs> and so th there is th th and the m movie sort of explores truth and, and, and honesty and deception in relationships, but it also explores the idea of self-worth uh, and how it relates to one's work. And can you dislike someone's work but still love them very much? And, and that's a legit question, I think, right? Right, and, and, and um, it's interesting. It's sort of the mirror image of a, of a question in the, in the culture right now about, about artists, you know, can you love the work of someone you completely disapprove of. Let's say if you disapprove of Woody Allen, hypothetically, you know, yes. um, can you still enjoy... Hypothetically, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I really appreciate you saying yeah. hypothetically. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> can, can, can you still enjoy Annie Hall, you know? Yes, and, exactly. And, um, one thing, uh, uh, but this is a whole other way of flipping the question and looking at it in a very intimate arena. One thing um, I want to talk to you about in connection with the movie is that it was written and directed by Nicole Hall Center. And yes. you, people, although you've only, I think, done two films together, yes. people are, are critics and others are saying, uh, rightly so, I think it's an extraordinary collaboration. And could you tell us something about her and how you met her and how 
both this movie and I'm sure many of you saw Enough Said, the previous movie that, that you did with her, with, with uh, Jim Gandolfini before he died, um, how they came about, how you found each other as sort of artistic soulmates, if I'm correct to characterize it that way. Yes, I, I think you are uh, correct in characterizing it that way because we met, we met on Enough Said, actually. We met, uh, uh, she was uh, thinking about me for the role, and so we got together and we started talking, and we realized uh, almost immediately, we, we couldn't believe that our paths hadn't crossed. We are roughly the same age. We have, both of us have two uh, boys also roughly the same age. Uh, we live near each other, and we're in this community of Hollywood, and, um, and she's making these films that are uh, so beautiful and comedic, but have a tenderness and a thoughtfulness that, I, I, they're the movies I like to go to, let's just put it that way, right? So we immediately connected, we had an absolute gas and a half doing enough said. It couldn't have been more fun. Mm. Um, and then I actually did also a, on the Amy Schumer show, she directed, Nicole directed, uh, uh, The Last Fuckable Day that I did on the Amy Schumer show. I didn't realize that she had directed that. That's, yeah, she directed that's great. that, right. And so, um, and then, the, oh. and then we've ever since then we've been trying to find a project to work on together, and because of her schedule and my schedule, and you know things uh, getting in the way, it really didn't happen until now. And we, she pitched me the idea for the movie before she even wrote it. Um, we were having lunch, and she told me the idea, and I just gasped, and I said, "I'm in. When are we shooting? Write this immediately." Uh, I've, I've got to do this film. So that's really how it happened. And we just have, um, she's, she's incredible, the, the words on the page are beautiful and gorgeous, but what's, and what's also wonderful about Nicole is that she's a great collaborator. And you know the way that I work, which is, Absolutely. Uh, uh, I, I like to <laughs> be collaborative with directors and writers in the moment. We can find stuff, we can enhance it, you know. And, and she's down for that. She's not too precious about her words, but she also has a very strong point of view. So I'm, I consider myself very blessed to have had this opportunity to do this film with her. And I hope we get to do another one, because I'm telling you, it, she's, uh, she's a great girl. And she basically writes all her projects. I mean, she's done some. Oh, yes. So, like, and then I know she worked on a show I really loved, Enlightened, by Mike White. That's right. For a couple of episodes, um, but basically she writes the stuff that That's she's right. a real yeah. full filmmaker in that. Yes, way. and she also she did the screenplay for uh, uh, Can You Ever Forgive Me. Oh, right. About she wrote that. She was nominated for an Oscar for that. That's right. About the about Lee Israel, right? Yes. The, yes, the plagiarist. Um, I'm so used to having worked with you for a lot of years in television. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, it's so I, funny to be sitting here and doing this. I have to, Frank and I are really good friends, and we've been in the trenches for so long. Oh, now. It's, it's, here it's, we are for, for doing this weird interview. I know, it's right. <laughs> <laughs> I promise not to hurt your feelings. No, uh, <laughs> um, uh, tell me, so you ha so as you describe uh, Nicole Hall of Senator's process as a filmmaker and her yes. artistry, it's a little parallel to the kind of television you, you've done with me and without me, but, it's, but how is the process different? Because like in Veep, there really is a huge amount of, I wouldn't say improv, but there's a lot of reworking. Fixing. In the, uh, fixing, yes. <laughs> um, in the day, in the moment. Yeah. Uh, uh, I assume on a, on a movie, uh, a feature like this, it's a tight schedule. It's super tight. It was very low budget. We shot this thing in 22 days. Wow. Um, we had no, we had one day of rehearsal. And wow. um, yeah, and, and you know, uh, unlike a television series, which has, you know, believe me, I love working on a series and working on a character for a, a long period of the time, but you don't know where you're headed in a television show in the way that you do on a film, God willing. Most, I, it, and, and so you know the beginning, middle, and end, right. and, and that was the case here. Um, but uh, there was an opportunity to uh, sort of futz with the material, and we had to think quick, because we, 
as I said, we were a low budget film. We couldn't do things like, you know, for example, when you're in New York and you may be shooting on a street and you would buy the street, which means, of course, they block the street off and you have it. Uh, well, in our case, we had no money to buy a street. So we, uh, we had a permit for a corner. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we had a lot of uh, New Yorkers uh, g going in and out of the shot. And uh, at one point, um, uh, somebody gave us the finger right on camera. <laughs> and, uh, and at another point, it was a scene in which I'm actually um, standing on a street corner vomiting, and a woman comes right into the shot, and she goes, oh my god, is she OK? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> I, 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 thought, I thought you were going to say, I'm, I'm having what she's having. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, um, <laughs> um, you, you mentioned, and I think many people in this room, including me, agree that one reason you, you like her movies you want to be in them, is it the kind of movie you like to see yes. yourself? And we have, and this has been true for some time, it isn't new, this bifurcated film industry, which is in chaos for all sorts of other reasons with streaming and so on, but it's, it's the kind of movie like this, a, a movie for grown-ups um, that uh, is, is brainy. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not intellectual, but it's, it's sophisticated, is yeah. what I'm looking for. Um, and is a comedy drama and then you have big franchise Hollywood movies that really run the business. And you've now, since Veep ended, had the experience of working in that kind of movie too. And I, I'd love for you to talk about what the experience has been like and, ha and what muscles you use differently as an as a actor and collaborator in, in the world of uh, Marvel comics. Well, um, I, I'll say that, you know, in the big franchise movies, uh, there's much better food on the set. Um, the, uh, the, it's funny, because when I did, I, you know, I, I didn't do, I didn't work on it for very long, but I was in the uh, Wakanda Forever movie, and I had the great opportunity to work with Ryan Coogler, who is just spectacular. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, uh, first of all, I had to make an adjustment because I'm so used to uh, trying to dig out as many jokes in a scene, right. you know? And uh, there was really no place for that. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to sort of uh, cool my jets in that sense, you right. know? Um, and they kept a few in, but believe me, there, there was stuff on the cutting room floor. But, um, well, I want to see that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, it's... It's certainly, it's a different kind of story. I don't know what to tell you. It's, it's um, uh, sort of, well, it's a cartoon that you're bringing to life. And, um, and a movie like Nicole's is a, a tiny, tiny little story about um, uh, human interactions in, in a small way. So, but you do, I will say, uh, this is probably a, a bad answer, except that you do have to bring truth to both. So even if you're playing, um, you know, who I play, which is this Contessa Valentina, Allegra de Fontaine is her name, <laughs> um, uh, you, you have to, as an actor, you have to think through, again, uh, what are my intentions in this scene? What is, what is it I'm trying to accomplish? What is this character trying to do? Uh, you need to think through backstory, all that kind of stuff. It still applies. It's just a, a, a slightly, perhaps more uh, arch kind of performance, tonally. Yeah. And do you, do you feel you have intimate moments as an actor, even though the tone is different and it's a cartoon? I mean, do you feel, do you feel yourself doing it? Do you feel like you can use your muscles as an actor, you know, within obvious limitations. And it's a yeah. huge ensemble piece as opposed to something right. like six characters. Yes, um, thus far, yes. I will admit that I'm about to go and uh, shoot a movie uh, called The Thunderbolts, and I'm going to be doing, I, I'm going to have much more to do in that film. So I will report back if uh, 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 there's, there's, a, there's a lot more work to be had. So we'll see. <laughs> and I, I guess I it means, screw it up. I guess it means you're going to do your own stunts. Um, actually, yes. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I you laugh. It's not funny. I'm doing it. <laughs> I have no doubt uh, you, you, you could do it. I still think of uh, you uh, walking through the glass door in Veep. Yeah, that um, was fun. To go back to Veep a second, not in a kind of a nostalgic way, because it's hard to be nostalgic given everything that's happened since, but I remember 
you were receiving an Emmy or something. We were one of these things, uh, and it was really about halfway through the life of the series when you said what we thought was, you know, this. Uh, uh, Hilarious satire is, in fact, a sobering documentary. documentary. Right. Um, and um, one of the, I've reflected often on the fact that, you know, we, we raced. When we start, started that show, Trump was not on the horizon. It was 2011. Yeah. Right. Then Trump arrived several seasons in. And I look back when I'm curious to hear your thoughts about it. We really were, like, racing against the devil because... As crazy as our characters were, and particularly Selena Meyer, yeah. your character, to outrun this <laughs> lunatic, um, it was, I, I can't believe we, we got through it and kept our dignity more or less intact. Right, exactly. I can't believe it either because, in fact, uh, he was doing a better version of our show. <laughs> Except, of course, it wasn't a comedy. It's <laughs> no, it a, wasn't. A complete tragedy, yeah. It's amazing, you know, Veep had, had a, a habit, I think it reflects the good writing of the writers worked on it, of yeah. predicting things that happened in Washington before they happened. Yeah. Um, and people would say, oh, you, you know, like the script was written a week before it aired, you know, you yeah. stole it from the... Um, but I, I particularly reflect back on towards the end when we had the most idiotic character in the show, Jonah, running for president. <laughs> and he was an anti-vaxxer. And this is before COVID. This is before COVID. It, sp it spreads whatever it was, measles yeah, or whatever, that's and right. kills his own stepfather. That's right. And people thought, oh, that's so absurd. There couldn't be characters right, like this in, right. in real life. Incredible. And he, and he uh, hung his whole sort of political future on, on trying to, uh, I can't even, um, abolish, savings, yeah. abolish savings, daylight savings time. Yeah, right. That's, that, 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 um, I think it was Marco Rubio was trying Marco to. Marco Rubio, yes. yes. He's, so, I mean, it happened time and time again. And I will point out to you that then we, we actually uh, got a female vice president. And so... Um, and now... And now... Yes, yeah. we have. And, and, and any time she uh, has a faux pas... I know. Your old footage is suited up and played. Uh, the Veep Thief music is played opposite her. I know. Her. I feel sorry for her. You I know. know. She doesn't, doesn't deserve that. No. Um, since... Since all that, since Veep, um, you've always been politically active, but you've, it seems, as like a lot of other people, including people in show business, you've stepped up, you've been really actively involved and engaged, in, and including at local levels in politics. Yes. Can, can you talk about that, what, what you've been doing, but also what's satisfying about it and what may be frustrating about it? Um, well, um, hmm. Well, what's frustrating, I, the, the thing that's frustrating is, is having to sort of, uh, I feel, work so hard to kind of uh, save, salvage our democracy as we know it. Um, and that is uh, a daunting task at times, right? Um, I, I, um, I have a social media platform that I try to use for the greater good, and that is, in fact, to sort of highlight uh, particularly candidates on the state and local level uh, to bring attention to the criti the urgency of these uh, local these state elections and legislature and so on uh, at, at the state level because um, that's where real changes uh, ha happens and can happen it seems and we just for example in Wisconsin had a uh, a wonderful win with Justice Janet, who, uh, yeah, for the state Supreme Court, and that's that's a, a, as well as other, a, a, as well as the other earlier race in Wisconsin. All of these uh, wins uh, are very. <laughs> I mean, Wisconsin has been identified as a as a democracy desert, really, for about the last ten years, yeah. um, and um, uh, because. You know, they, the, the maps have been gerrymandered and so on to a fare thee well, as my dad used to say. So I think, um, uh, uh, anyway, I, I, I don't know why I'm talking about Wisconsin right now, except to say that um, I, I, I'm, I'm interested in sharing my platform to raise awareness and spotlight. I, I'm not a professional politician. I don't know all the issues uh, by heart, but I certainly know, I feel strongly about people I support and, um, and as a citizen of the United States, I want to do as much as I can to, to uh, um, get people out to vote and hopefully vote for the right people. 
I assume in this very polarized uh, uh, kind of vicious world we're in right now yeah. involving social media, you must get really some ugly feedback. Yes. You, can you insulate yourself from it pretty much? Not yeah, I pay, I pay no attention. Good. <laughs> There's well, no reason to. It's useless. I, f I feel that the best thing about uh, Elon Musk turning Twitter into a right-wing outpost is we don't have to look at it anymore. Right. Uh, Although I will say, uh, the, the Twitter thing is so confounding. I, I will say I haven't pulled myself off of it because it's a good avenue to communicate with voters still. And so I, I use it for that reason. But anyway, yeah, it's nuts out there. <laughs> it, real, it, really, it really is. It's nuts. Um, what's, the, what's the political atmosphere of if that's the right way to describe it, in LA around the writer's strike. It's very, in New York, you don't quite feel how it's rocking the industry. Do you get a sense from friends, people you know, people actively involved, what the, the mood is, the emotions of it all? I think the mood, I, 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 I believe the mood is very serious. Uh, this feels different than the, to me. This is just my, you know, I, my take on it. I could be wrong, but if, to me, it feels more serious than the first strike. Or not the first strike, the, the, strike last, in, the, the last, last strike, strike. pardon yeah, me, right. yes. Um, I, there's a, there's a, 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 so much on the line, and, and the, the middle class in our industry is really just getting squeezed out of it, and um, it's not just, and um, I'm, I'm hopeful that the writers will prevail, and uh, you know, SAG is having a vote now to authorize uh, our, our board to strike as well. An authorization, not to strike, but an authorization to strike. Do you find yourself even innocently or accidentally getting caught up in debates about it among people you know in the industry or not really? Pretty no, much everybody I know is, feels the same way, to tell you I, the truth. Yeah, I, cer I certainly yeah. do. Yeah. Um, and um, one other thing that you're doing that I, I want to hear about is uh, a podcast. How did you get into that? Uh, I know it's a ton of work from yeah. you and from other people who do it. It, 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 it's it's um it's it's a fascinating idea, and I know you're going to do more of it. And can you keep finding candidates to be on it? Explain explain the premise. Explain <laughs> the premise. I worry that actuarial tables will come back to haunt it. Um, but uh, explain, explain. Um. So I I was I watched when the documentary came out. I watched it uh, on Jane Fonda on HBO, or shall I say, Max. <laughs> Um, really? Ever in your life heard of anything as stupid as changing the name to Max? <laughs> but um, it, it, it sort of sounds like a laxative. It sounds like a laxative. It sounds like a sanitary napkin. It could be anything. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> it could be anything. That's what that's what they're thinking. It could be anything, and therefore it's nothing. But anyway, go on. Shit. Well, anyway, so um, <laughs> so um, Max. Yeah. Max. So anyway, and uh, I was watching that it, uh, the Jane Fonda documentary. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I recommend it because it's very, uh, it's utterly fascinating. And I was quite struck by the um, scope of her life, and uh, and she's had so many. She's just had so much experience as a human being that was, and I was riveted. Um, and then I began to think. And she's 85, and I began to think, why are we not hearing from these older women? We, there are so many older women out there that I'm, I'm not hearing from. And, and she was imparting a lot of wisdom in this documentary. And, and so I thought, God, I really would love to, you know, really be fun to find a podcast where someone was talking to older women. And then it didn't exist, so I thought, all right, well, I'll, <laughs> I'll try it. And, um, and so... Um, and, and that's what I've done. I'm, it's a podcast in which I have a conversation with older women to sort of glean their wisdom, to, to sort of get cliff notes on life. Uh, and, um, and because I think certainly in our culture, women, as they age, become less and less visible. Um, they're not heard. Uh, they're not, uh, frankly, revered the way they should be. And so that's what this is about. This is about uh, getting... Uh, advice, it's about wising up 
and that's what um, I'm, I'm trying to do. And we've had really fun conversations, amazing conversations. Isabel Allende and I know Amy Tan. Amy Tan just dropped this week. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was listening to uh, my friend Fran Leibowitz. Yes. First of all, I was amazed that. that uh, she said her age so flatly. She said, yeah. she, she, I'm 72, and you asked, how, how, how old do you feel? 82. I know. Uh, um, so funny. Um, but uh, uh, she, I found that uh, I, I know her very well. And I, yes. I, um, she was very candid and, and fresh on the show. She said things that I hadn't heard her say before. Oh, really? You know, including in public arenas and in the Scorsese documentaries that yes. she's done. It was, it was really fresh. How, tell us, you, you must prepare in a way like a journalist. How do you prepare and how do you, is it done by Zoom? It has to be done by Zoom, I, I yeah, guess. We, um, yes, we did. It's all done by Zoom, uh, except for the very last one of this season, which is coming out in a couple weeks. Uh, Can you say who it is? Um, yes, it's Carol Burnett. Oh, my God. That's fantastic. Yeah. And that one you did in person? That one I, mean, I go did on, in I don't person. Mean to, I want to come back to Carol Burnett. Yeah, yeah, on. yeah. So um, uh, it's all done by Zoom, and it is so much research, um, and th that I, it's a lot. It's a lot more work than I thought it would be. I'm not going to lie. I mean, it. Uh, you listen to these podcasts sometimes, and it is the case. Some of these people are just sitting in front of a microphone and just talking about anything. I mean, it. it they're. It, it seems very loose and easy, but in this case, I, I, I can't approach these conversations like that. I need to really. Because my goal is to have a proper conversation, and right. my goal is to talk about uh, about life through the lens of what have you learned, what can you tell us, what is in store for us, let us know, please. And um, and so that takes you know you don't want to blow it. I, I don't want to blow it in the conversation. So I want to come at it with some uh, you know. A, a, some idea of who I'm talking to, right? Right, yeah. yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, um, what if, what is, I, I, this may be a difficult you can, uh, question to answer on the fly, but not necessarily the most uh, uh, insightful or most surprising bit of wisdom you heard, but a couple of examples, they don't have to be the most, of things that you're really taken aback by. Yeah. In, in a, in a good way, not necessarily in a bad way, of things that people told, said that you didn't expect them to say. Well, um, yeah, I can tell you a few uh, that come to mind. Uh, no is a complete sentence was something that really resonated with me. Uh, Jane Fonda uh, was wow. imparting that tidbit. Um, and I think it's particularly interesting as a woman to consider that because I think women are more inclined to apology, and, um, and it's hard to say no sometimes. It's hard to say no, just no. Um, uh, uh, many of these women said a similar thing, which was uh, th the way to stay, um, the way to age well is to keep trying new things and even things that scare you. Mm. Um, and which was, actually it was Ruth Reichel, the wonderful Ruth Reichel was one of the guests, I know, she's so incredible. And she said, she, I, she may have been the first one to say that, and I remember thinking, and she was one of the first in, interviews or conversations that I had, and I remember thinking, oh God, Doing this podcast scares the crap out of me. It really does. It's it's it does scare. It's me. something new. It's something. it's something new. And then I thought, oh god, now I really have to keep doing it. <laughs> but but um, uh, yeah. So those are just a few. And I would say that a, a, another theme, a takeaway for me, is that with all of these women, um, uh, I am. It, 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 they, they, when I, it's particularly when I talk with Isabel Allende, and she is living such a marvelous life right now, and she is so, she's 81 or 82, and she is um, really filled with joy. And mm. um, she, the way she talked about her life and the ability now at this age to let go of certain things that she can really let go of, it, it made turning 82 like, oh my God, I can't wait to turn 82. <laughs> You know, yeah. I mean, it really, there is um, a beauty that is revealed 
about getting older, I think, in these conversations that I find very uh, uplifting, for real. It, it sounds, it's very exciting. Um, do people, some of the women are married, some are not. Yep. Some have families, some don't, I yes. assume. And is, is that an interesting uh, kind of um, variable in these conversations? Do you find different yeah. take, takes? Yeah, on? because I'm, I'm interested, you know, some of these people have children, some don't. They've had careers. I want to hear about how they did that. Yeah. Right? I mean, well, it's a, the working mother thing is no joke. That's hard work. And I would imagine if you're, if, you've had that experience, as Carol Burnett did, for example, uh, and she's 90. Uh, how did she do that um, back in 1969, you know? How did she raise those kids and run a television show? Run a television show that was live, right. that had so much content, as they say now. Right. Sketch after, they were long, they had, you know, yes. people forget there were many more episodes a season. Yeah. It was a variety show with a whole, with a repertory group of actors That's in right. essence. So you did, you had a conversation with her in person. Can you describe the setting or the ambience or the mood of it at all? Oh God, I'm telling you, it was, my, my feeling was that I was breathing rarefied air. Mm. And uh, I was, I, could, I can actually start crying just thinking about it. It was so, moving to be in a room with her and, um, and to have the opportunity to talk to her intimately. Um, I, and I had, of course, the great pleasure of reviewing so many things that she had done uh, in anticipation of, not that I didn't know, but you know, I wanted to remember it. And I was very struck by how she, without my even realizing it, how she modeled uh, for me, this, you know, mm. my, uh, so many things in my life um, that I, I learned from her without even realizing, realizing I was learning from her at a young age. And so I was able to tell her that. And so uh, I, let's just say I cried through the entire thing. Oh my God. <laughs> I did. It was, I was a mess. But um, she's a, a very, um, a very kind human being, like, and very mm. uh, upbeat. And she's had a lot of tragedy in her life. Oh. And, um, and yet, and yet, she has remained a very positive person um, against the, a certain odds, for sure. So mm. she's, a, she's definitely a hero. And that was a, a complete moment of grace to be able to talk to her. Yeah. Look, I can't wait to hear it. Yeah, you know, I hope you like it. There's some, when, when I was first discovering her as a kid, I remember she, she became famous. With a, uh, with a song that I've never been able to find a recording of. Oh, yeah. Uh, called I Made a Fool of Myself Over John Foster, Foster Dulles. Dulles, that's right. That yeah. she, sa she sang it at uh, uh, like an, it a the, village club, maybe? She, yes. And she did it yeah, on And she TV. did it on the Gary Moore show. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, it was a big hit. That was her sort of uh, right. foray. And then she also, uh, and of course, she was in Once Upon a Mattress, and that well, sort of established yes. her as that, yeah, that yeah, was, a big yeah. Broadway star. And she's best friends with Julie Andrews. How cool is that? Yeah, and that's amazing. And they used to do specials They together. used to do specials. It's extraordinary to watch that footage. You, you can't get, believe it. You should get Julie Andrews. She's on my list. Oh, good, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm fascinated. I don't, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know, me too, yeah. me too. Um, thinking of classic TV series, go back one step. Maybe you're being asked a lot because the, co the anniversary coinciding with your giving interviews about your new film, but... Seinfeld's 25th uh, uh, anniversary um, of, the of, it, of the finale. Right. And um, what, when, you, when you look back at it now, it's such a seminal show. Does it seem like ancient history, like another life for you, or is it still very much in the front of your brain? Or your... It's not in the front of my brain. It does feel like it was 25 years ago. <laughs> that sounds extremely healthy. <laughs> <laughs> but both of us have had, in fact, speaking of finales, uh, Frank, as you know, is, is a, a executive producer of Succession, and we've got a big one coming up this weekend. So here's what happens in the final episode. <laughs> uh, it's very hard to find a way to end a show. You know, when, yes. 
went through it on Veep. I know you went through it on Seinfeld, yes. Sopranos. It's, al it's always, and then Game of Thrones. And That's every, right. And, and some of them disappoint and some of them don't. Yes. And, uh... <laughs> right? Yes. Yes, I'd say that's the case. Yes. Well, there's a lot of expectation around these shows that are, that are beloved, and that's understandable. But, um, God, what a season you've had on Succession this well, thank I you. have to say the um, spoiler alert. I'm about to say something. It's already happened, but I, I figure most people here have watched the series. Uh, plug your ears if you're not up to speed. But I really do think that, that uh, killing off Logan... Uh, <laughs> I told you. Damn it! We ears. just lost. We just lost a viewer. Uh. Um, but I think that that was inspired. I have to say, utterly inspiring. Well, inspired, not inspiring. The inspiration was that of the, the show's creator Jesse Armstrong, yes. who wrote. On Veep. He wrote the last episode of season one of Veep, the one where Selena cries, sort of Hillary Clinton style. That's right, which I won an Emmy for, for you, that particular one. <laughs> yeah. And, and he, um, you know, he's, he's a, as you know, and you've worked with him on another project as well. He, uh, yes. Uh, he's a fantastic guy. He's very modest. He's super smart. And he always said, you know, the way, the typical way to do it is that a character like that is on his deathbed in the final episode of, of the show. And he always said, I want him uh, to die three or four episodes into whatever season it happens so we have the runway to see what happens to these kids who are traumatized by this father yes. once he's gone. Brilliant. And it really is, I think everyone thought it was brilliant except for Brian Cox. But, uh, <laughs> no, but, uh, no, but Brian, Brian, Brian. No, but Brian, Brian was with the program. We, no, we just had to make sure he didn't tell the world after. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. But, but um, uh, uh, yeah, so it was really, uh, you know, it was really a, a great idea. And really, yeah. I think it's been really, given it. It, really fantastic, yeah. Um, in, in your conversation with Fran, you talked about um, your affection for New York City. And as oh. Sue said earlier, you, you did, you, 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 uh, 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 you you were he learned how to be a dancer here. Uh, <laughs> how to be a dancer. Uh, how to be a dancer. Right. Well, the dancing did come in handy yeah, in a way you didn't handy, expect. Yeah. Um, Those weren't quite the moves they were teaching me. Yeah. Though. In fact, they're they're going to take uh, royalty on that. Um, but um, uh, and then and then of course you you had like me you had to live in Washington, which is another story. But tell, um, I was very taken by the fact that. Uh, uh, your affection for New York, um, and the, and I guess we can say that you now have place here. I can't say you're living here exactly, but no. Um, but but tell tell us about your feelings about the city and and you know and about L.A. and and you know I think a lot of people in New York don't really understand the good parts of it. You know they know the so the. So the <laughs> They know the, the good parts they know, of what? They know of, uh, of the of Los city? Angeles. Of Los Angeles. So oh, of Los Angeles. Oh, hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, talk, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to hear you riff on this a little bit about the two city, tale of well, two cities. Well, I mean, I, <laughs> tale of two cities, right? Yeah. So yes, I was born here, and I lived here until I was about eight years old. And um, well, hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. And um, uh, and I uh, uh, and then we moved from here and uh, uh, traveled and ultimately I ended up in Washington DC with my mother and stepfather. Um, and, uh, but my dad remained in New York and I would go back and forth between the two cities in my youth. Um, I have, I have a, a visceral feeling about the city. It feels like my home, to be honest with you. And in fact, when we first went to Los Angeles, um, because we went there for work, my, I say we, my husband and I, actually we weren't even married then, we went, we we're looking to, for work in, in show business, and we went, and I remember saying to Brad, I said, look, okay, I, I'll live here for a year, and we were about to get married, and I said, and we'll get married, but, uh, I am, I'm going to tell you something, when we have kids, I am not raising them 
in Los Angeles. <laughs> Cut to, both of them are raised in Los Angeles. <laughs> um, and it's been, it's been a great city for, for all sorts of reasons, and I don't mean to sound ungrateful, and actually, I love the state of California, not gonna lie, I think it's a great state. Um, but um, uh, uh, I, it's, it's not, it's obviously quite different, and is it okay to love both places? I do, I do love both places. I think that's all right to say. I'm not, I, I'm not uh, bullshitting at all. I mean, I really, there, there are things about California that are dear, near and dear to my heart, um, actually many things, but the same is true of New York City. Yeah. No, I get it, yeah. I, you know, I've, I, I, You've spent a lot of time. I've spent a lot of time there yeah. in Veep and in work and one of my sons lives there and, yes. and, as an adult and, um, uh, and, I, and I like it. I, you know, I, 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 I've always sort of, Found something romantic about it in a way, and I and I and California is an incredible, incredible, state. yeah. With all due respect to Albany and Buffalo, you know. It's a, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> uh, we shot a lot of White House plumbers upstate, and I'm still feeling oh the my pain. Um, here's a great here here here's a great question about involving the podcast. Okay. From an audience member, first P.S. Love your style. Said, Thank loves you. the podcast. Will you please give us your marmalade recipe? Oh, you mean off the top of my head? <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, but but the, 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 the more important question is, and I think it's a great one having met her, any chance you might interview your mom? Her, and I should say, I can say it. You know, J Julia's mom is lovely through a weird coincidence. She lives in the same apartment house in Washington as my stepmother, my, um, <laughs> they're like, neighbors no. probably annoying the hell out of each other. Knowing my stepmother, at least she's annoying your mother, but, no, but, she's, uh, not. but um, uh, she's also uh, an accomplished and lovely published poet. Yes. And has had a quite an interesting life. So what, what about, that? that's a good pitch, I think. I think it is a good pitch, and it's something we're certainly considering because people seem to have cottoned to my mother. I, at the end of the, every episode of the podcast, I, um, I call my, or I Zoom with my mother, assuming she can get the fucking Zoom to work. And, um, <laughs> and, um, um, <laughs> and uh, I, t I talk to her and sort of download what just happened because... Um, I like to download things with my mom, general, generally speaking, and she's a very thoughtful person. So I think my mother certainly does have a lot of wisdom, um, and uh, so I think that that's a possibility. Yeah. Great. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite Seinfeld episode that you were in? Oh. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, when, if, when I watch anything related to Seinfeld, it's usually <laughs> the blooper reels because <laughs> it, it brings back to me the uh, profound feeling of happiness and joy I had making that show. So I can just tell you, you know, the scenes in which a Festivus, for example, um, <laughs> that scene at the table with Tracy Letts uh, and, I, and I come in and because I it was all schwitzy and, and makeup and I, I, can't, I can't even remember the plot quite to be honest but um, trying to get through scenes because and, and, and failing to do so because they were so funny that, that's sort of my favorite aspect of the show which is so I like all the episodes but the ones that were hard to get through were my favorite um, Do you, do you believe it's always best to tell the truth versus hurting someone's feelings? Always tell the truth, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> under all circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> all right. That's is, that, is that good? That's very good. Okay. That is a winning answer. I don't think you can improve on the answer, but... Try. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I think, um, uh, I, I actually do, to a certain extent, I do believe that, except that um, I think the truth can be perhaps, um, hmm, I was going to say fudged a little, but um, sometimes the truth is hard to bear, uh, hard to receive, and hard to give. Uh, and so I think the, the name, the word of the day is kindness, which needs to be applied to all truth-telling. And, um, and 
so that's how I try to communicate with the people that I love. Yeah. Good. Um, Veep is a show I go back to because I love the characters who are terrible people. Yeah. Um, from both a writing perspective and an acting perspective, how do you make unlikable characters lovable? Ugh. I, I have a, th I have a theory. I mean, I think tr truthfulness is, is, I mean, you, oh. you uh, mm. don't you think, you, you standing outside Selena, you think um, she's a, you know, fucking nightmare. She's horrible. Yeah. You know, she's, you know, everything right. about her. She's, she's, she's selfish. She's self-serving. Yes. Um, she's contemptuous of everybody. She's yes. a terrible mother. Um, <laughs> you know, on and please on. Please go on, please. But, but am I correct that? Um, you have to find some humanity within her or you couldn't play it. Absolutely. You can't play her like a villain. Yeah. You can't hate the character you're playing. She's that way for a reason. And I identified with her feeling of frustration, bitterness, um, and, you know, as a, as a woman in politics, I mean, give me a break. That's a hard road to toe. Um, uh, no matter what side of the aisle you're on, that's just a bitch. And, um, and I identify with that, you know? I, and I think uh, I could certainly uh, uh, understand, there, you know, there are parallels, of course, between politics and show business, uh, and uh, because you're selling a brand of yourself, and you're trying to stay relevant, and uh, that can be hard in show business. And you can get mad. And she's mad. Mm -hmm. She's mm -hmm. mad. And I understand why she's mad, even though she's insane. Right, yeah. <laughs> Look, you know, it's, it's, it's Succession, which has several writers that overlap. That's deep, right. Um, it's the same thing. The, the characters are completely hateful uh, 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 in their own ways. Yeah. And, um, and the actors sometimes talk about the same way you do. But also in the writing, humor is... is a, is a really interesting component, I think, because um, in the case of Succession, the characters have no va values. They're horrible people. They're cruel. They're stabbing each other in the back. You know, it's, it's, but they're kind of witty. They're kind of intentionally funny. I mean, they say they say yes. things that actually, except for one character, cousin Greg, is sort of the Joan of the situation. <laughs> but the other character, you know, the, the Roman is sort of witty. Shiv sort of witty. Um, and when you laugh with them. You're sucked into them in a way because that's a human trait, yes. and I think it's and it, so when people say I can't believe I'm feeling teary or sentimental about one of these characters or I'm sorry Logan died, I think that's part of the way they're sucked in in the writing as well as the truthfulness of the performances and all the actors say I have to identify with the characters because yeah. otherwise they're just empty you're, villains. Yeah, you're just you're not doing your job. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So the last question, it probably is, um, is it's a very glib question, and, and, and I, I doubt, refuse to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've been married 36 years. What's the secret? The secret is marry Brad Hall. <laughs> I think we should end on that yeah. happy note. Yeah. Good answer. Thank you. Thank you.